All right, we got the last five pitches coming up pretty soon. Uh, and don't forget, you get the chance to vote after every session. So we'll throw up the URL after the first pitch. And please be sure to share your vote. Uh, the, there is prizes associated with your vote. So the team that does win will walk away with a bunch of cool prizes, which we'll announce at the end. Uh, so don't forget to pay attention and support the team that you care about. To evaluate these pitches, as you know, we went through an online judging process uh, a couple months ago where a bunch of people who uh, applied online from all over the world and we ended up with, that's an awesome photo, uh, don't suck. Um, it, where we ended up with are these last 10 finalists uh, based on the, the judging process. And what we're going to do, what we same thing as we did yesterday, is have five uh, investors share their feedback, and then they're going to vote in a private room based on who they think should win. So what I'd like to do is welcome to the stage the following judges. First, we have Mike Rothenberg of Rothenberg Ventures. Please join the stage. Thank you, Mike. Next up, we have Christine Sai from 500 Startups. Thank you. One and a half, Christine. Thank you, Christine. Next up, the wonderful Jenny Fielding of BBC Worldwide. Next up, I'm going to get her last name wrong, Millie Tatewalt. It's all right, right? Acceptable. Yeah. Last but not least, we must bookend with another male. Rob Hayes, please join the stage for first round. We'll just have a party up here. All right, so just to give you a little bit of background so you know where these people are, are coming from, uh, Mike, who I met very recently, uh, is the manager of his own fund, correct? Yeah, called Rothenberg Ventures. That's probably why it's called that. Um, and he's focused on investing in talented and passionate world-class founders. He additionally, um, Mark is a recent graduate from HBS, alumni 2004-13. He's the director of Rothenberg Investments, where he manages private equity capital to invest in condos and land development in vibrant central Texas, which is where you're from. Yeah, I, I did that right before this. Got um, it. 10-4. Yeah. 10-4. Awesome. Um, I also got an email from him earlier today. Uh, which highlighted all the females that he's invested in. And at this point, his uh, portfolio has 20% female founders. So thank you. That's awesome. I'm not sure why I'm talking into this mic. I'm actually using a lapel. <laughs> so I, need to, I, need, I need to stop doing that. I just like, oh, yeah. Let's move this away. It's just very confusing. Next up, Christine, a partner at 500 Startups who we love. 500 Startups has invested in a number of companies that have been on this stage. Um, and some of those companies have already seen an exit, which is exciting. Uh, but before 500, blowing up, as they say, things, um, she was previously at Google and YouTube, uh, working on products such as AdSense, Google Analytics, YouTube, API syndication, and other developer products. Um, before that, Life Online, she worked in international sales at OSI Soft and refining central technologies for Chevron Texaco. That sounds really scary. Um, she holds a BA in Cognitive Science from the University of California, Berkeley. Do we have Berkeley grads in the crowd? What? Really? I, there's got to be more. Okay, do we have any ballet dancers in the crowd? Well, because she does ballet as well. <laughs> um, and at this point, uh, the 500 Startups portfolio, I believe, is somewhere to 25 to 30% women, female founders as well. So give it up for Christine. Next up, we have Jenny, Jenny Fielding. She heads up new digital ventures for BBC Worldwide, and she also runs their BBC Worldwide Labs program. Previously, she was the CEO at 440 Inc., the company that developed a, a product called Wenzani, which I did play around with, uh, for the, the book that we all use all the time, Lonely Planet. Jenny has a history in tech, co-founding startups, as well as she co-founded a company called Switch Mobile, a disruptive VoIP mobile software company that was acquired in 2008. She also has been a CEO for Woden Capital and a VP at JP Morgan and a lawyer at Wyden Kennedy in her, 
career, which blows my mind how many different roles she's had. It's amazing. She sits on the board and advises a bunch of startups and companies. Um, she's also an advisor to Women 2.0. Uh, and she also advises Textingly and Astia. And through the BBC Worldwide Labs, Labs, <laughs> Labs, Labs. <laughs> um, the, the first program had 50% females, and this time around, 30% female founder, which is exciting. Give it up for Jenny. <laughs> Millie Tade Walt. God, I knew she told me earlier, too. And Tad Walt. Thank you, Millie. Uh, she's an executive entrepreneur and engineer based here in San Francisco. She's currently, a, what I love her title, venture hacker at AngelList, uh, where she works on online syndicates, funds products, and the company's talent platform. Um, she told me on, on the phone or on email, I think it was email, uh, that she basically decides which startups are going to be profiled at the sort of front page of AngelList. So you need to know her. Um, previously, Millie uh, was a founder um, of a couple companies, so Cake Style, Doggy Loot, Lost Crates, Dash Mob, and New Media Methods. She was a managing director at a venture capital firm called Sandbox Industries and a consultant at BCG. She holds degrees from UC Davis and Harvard Law School. I didn't know that. Good to know. So don't mess with Jenny. Give it, Mel, Jenny, Millie. Give it up for Millie. Thank you. <laughs> Last but not least, are you comfortable there? You look a little squished. You okay? Okay, oh, no, Rob. Good. Just checking. Okay, it looks like you're falling off from this side of the room. <laughs> Welcome, Rob, partner at First Round Capital. Prior to First Round, he was at Omidyar um, as their first venture investor, and he led most of their initial venture capital deals and later built and ran the technology investing group. Um, so, oh, that was at Palm. No, that was, was Omidyar. Okay, I thought I was getting this all mixed up. Here, so while at Palm, he started the corporate venture fund. Okay, so you did this twice now. Now I understand. And managed a strategy effort that led the spin out for Palm Source. He began his career with the Japan External Trade Ex Organization, building relationships between US and Japanese businesses during a time when trade friction between the two was at its peak. Hmm, interesting, very challenging. So Rob has his MBA from Columbia and his bachelor's from UC Berkeley. Got a lot of Berkeley crowds on this, this panel. It's awesome. Very cool. Uh, and with that, any stats you'd like to share? You don't have to. Yeah. Nice. Awesome. Good to hear. Thank you so much, Rob, and first round for joining. OK, enough about you guys. Now it's about the finalists. So what we're going to do is bring the first one to the stage. We have a company called Fosubo. Uh, and Fosubo is short for Forget the Suggestions Box. Hey, OK, now it makes sense. Fosubo is a B2B SaaS solution that allows customers to easily create reviews for specific employees they've actually interacted with. And to the stage, I bring the CEO, Misa Chen. Cookie having girl problems, I feel bad for you, son. I Good got time. 99 problems, but a bitch ain't one. Hey. I'm the CEO, co-founder of Fasubo. And I'd like to show you how we are revolutionizing customer service one interaction at a time. So we all know that customer service is really important. But in my previous business, I learned just how important customer service was from the business owner's perspective. It could really make or break your business. So I wanted to try to find a solution out there that could help business owners and improve their customer service. And this was the most sophisticated solution I could find out there. So this is a receipt from a drugstore. And on the bottom of the receipt, you can call this 1-800 number, enter a 16-digit transaction number, and take 15 minutes out of your day to leave feedback and win $10,000. And so I want to ask you guys, when was the last time that you saw this on the bottom of your receipt, let alone taken 15 minutes out of your day to leave a review? Yeah, it's really, it's really surprising that they can even get any feedback through this channel. And actually, it turns out they get almost no feedback at all, less than 5%. And that's really not that surprising. But what is surprising is that Fasubo has response rates of over 30%. Now, let me show you, woo, yes. <laughs> now, let me show you how we have such high response rates. This is how we work. 
so we, the defining part of Fasubo is that we allow customers to leave feedback in a quick and easy process. So imagine you go into a store that has our software. After leaving that store, you then receive a text through SMS to your phone. And you can click on that text and review that individual interaction that you had. It takes two minutes and you can leave as short or long a review as you'd like. And then once you submit that feedback, that feedback is received by the owner, manager, and even employee of that store. So it gets everyone involved in the customer feedback system. And so in sum, we are a browser-based solution that offers a frictionless way to receive real-time feedback and deliver insights to the right stakeholders in a company. Now let me tell you about the story of Fasubo. Back in August, we launched with a T-Mobile retailer. They had seven stores in Southern California. These are the owners, uh, James Ryan and Franco. And basically, at the time, they were really struggling with customer service. They were in the bottom 10% for customer service. And so we wanted to change that. We wanted to help them. And we enrolled all their employees in Fasubo, all their stores. And we're happy to say that within less than three months, we brought them to number two for customer service out of 56 retailers in the nation. Woo! <laughs> so now let me show you, besides for T-Mobile, this is actually a very big market. There's over 7 million services and retail companies in the US alone, employing 42 million people, making it a $20 billion market. And so let me show you where we're in that market so far. Back in August, we launched with T-Mobile. And then actually in September, we won Angel Hack Global Demo Day out of over 32 cities and over 1,000 business plans submitted from around the world. And then by December, we, became, we brought uh, the T-Mobile retailer up to number two in the nation. We're now working with auto retailers and uh, phone retailers. And we are also a plug-in for a POS system. And so these are our numbers. These are our financials. And, um, and so if you're interested in them, I'd love to discuss with them, uh, them with you off stage and uh, go ahead and contact me. And this is our team. We have over 20 years. We're an awesome team. We have over 20 years of startup experience. And we're currently looking to raise starting today and make connections. You can email me at misa at fasubo.com or also visit our AngelList profile above. And besides from me telling you how Fasubo works, I would like to show you how Fasubo works. You can go ahead and text the word review to the number above and let me know how I did on my pitch just now. Thank you so much. <laughs> One, two. All right. 30 seconds earlier. Pretty impressive. Yeah, so now they have time to review. So, <laughs> all right, judges, so take it about. away. Questions? So how do you actually acquire customers? What, it, what, it, what is the process, and, and how long does it take? Acquire? Yeah. So it depends on the vertical. So it's pretty unbelievable. In the auto industry, we have two dealerships right now. One of our auto dealers is so excited about us, he actually referred us to three more. So I have three more appointments this week. It's not even outbound sales with that. With, uh, our, we're fully focusing our outbound sales on the T-Mobile retailer via, uh, vertical. So uh, for example, we're talking, we're in final talks with a guy, he owns 56 stores. So that's the primary vertical that we're looking to expand in in the next year. Mike, Mike. It's on, it's on, it's on, it's on. So what are you doing to kind of work around that? So do you mean that T-Mobile doesn't have a presence on Yelp? Are we trying to improve their presence on Yelp? No, I mean, people don't love T-Mobile, and they don't love Marriott Hotels, and they don't love these, you know, these places. And so they're pretty happy to rant and rave and write negative things, but they don't necessarily write positive things. So how, do you, how are you working in that? that that's one of the, the problems in the whole kind of review ecosystem. Well, basically, our solution is that we want to get employees. We're very much employee-centric. We want to get them involved in customer service. So by getting the employees involved and allowing them to see you know, that they receive a compliment that day, they, they see in their email they receive a compliment, they know how they can work on their improvement and get them involved in the re review process and feedback process. But I guess what I'm asking is, how, what, what is it in your app that really makes people want to write a positive review about that as opposed to so a it, negative? It's actually very surprising. We do have a high majority of our reviews are very positive. So then basically, the stellar salespeople, they stand out to their bosses and owners. And they see you know, who's doing a really great job with customer service. Because there's so many 
Uh, people, there's so many uh, software solutions out there that track sales, but they don't track customer retention. And the salespeople are doing a great job at customer service and in getting customers to come back. Is there like any kind of incentive for the customer? Maybe yeah, oh, so the customer incentive, basically another really cool feature that we have is that uh, in the text, it actually provides a return business. So say there's a car dealer we're working with and they're offering a discount on their next service appointment. Service appointment. So the customer can request the... Um, <laughs> I don't know what that is either. <laughs> <laughs> they can request that coupon at the end of the uh, filling out the survey. So it's a really great customer incentive to fill out that review. And we actually have a 50% click-through rate for that. So are you, it sounds like the, the type of customers that are using like the, the receipt, you know, like fill out the survey and get a chance to win 10,000. It sounds like you're probably targeting more bigger brands or bigger businesses versus like SMBs. So it, it depends. So for example, with the T-Mobile retailers, it's a really great space to be in because it's not a huge enterprise sale, but we can make quite a bit of traction. So, um, you know, it, it's franchisees who maybe own, you know, 10 to up to 200 stores. So we can still make good traction, but it won't take you know a year and a half relationship. And what's the sales cycle on these? Like, how long does it take? Uh, so for a car dealer, I've actually secured a car dealer in less than a month. It was only about two weeks, and then referrals are great. I mean, this is the guy who's referring us to three additional dealerships, and then um, you know retailers, uh, T-Mobile retailers. We're still in talks with him, but it's been only about two weeks, and he's already bringing it up at his board meeting this next week. So it moves pretty fast. What's the pricing structure like, and how does it compare to the competitors that you mentioned that have a lower conversion? So uh, that's the thing. So for auto dealers, it's one ninety nine a month. Um, and then for the T-Mobile retailers, it depends on the foot traffic of the store. It can range between 99 up to four ninety nine a month. So if you're doing a kind of call it a 1000 to 2000 bucks a year for each customer, that, that implies you need a lot of customers to build a to build a big company, how do you how do you how do you scale this from the handful of customers well, you have today to you know tens of thousands, of hundred thousands of customers? Well, actually, so uh, there are fifteen hundred T-Mobile retailers in the U.S. alone. So most of these retailers that we're talking to, they own at least fifty stores. So it's not just like we're securing each store at a time. Uh, but we also have received a lot of inbound sales inquiries from very very large enterprises as well, and we're beginning to talk. Uh, to beginning to build those relationships like there's a private equity firm that owns you know 34 brands and they're interested in having us in their restaurants so there's a lot of opportunity there and we're definitely exploring those opportunities for longer term growth how do you capture the customer's cell phone number in those occasions where it's not sort of obvious to provide that with a transaction that's a great question so basically uh, like I said with the demo uh, the text the word review to that number that's the option, another option, an avenue channel to be able to get that feedback. And you can either text your waitress's name as well, things like that. So we have that technology available and that channel available. And time. Thank okay. you. Thank awesome. you. OK. Some rumbling in the back, some things falling over, a lot of fun. All right, next we have up forgetting I don't need this mic uh, is the company called Sensely which is Sensely is a personalized Siri like virtual assistant for chronic illnesses very interesting and we're gonna bring to the stage the CMO who is a PhD MD Ivana Schmore come to the stage Thank you. Well, hello, everybody. Uh, I am uh, Dr. Ivana Schnur. I am the Chief Medical Officer of Sensely. And uh, I'm really excited to tell you how we're helping doctors and nurses uh, uh, take care of people with serious chronic diseases to live longer and healthier. Um, my co-founder, Adam, and I uh, created a cloud-based chronic care management uh, platform uh, that spans from caregivers to uh, patients um, to the doctors and nurses. And we took especially long time to create the patient interface and we created Molly. Uh, Molly is a virtual nurse that works on mobile devices, uh, television, computers. Uh, she is voice driven and let me show you what I mean by that. How 
did you sleep last night? I didn't sleep very well at all. Let me ask you a few follow-up questions. Was your sleep restful? No. Please tell me what happened. I tossed and turned, I couldn't breathe. How many pillows did you use? Three. Now, let's do some measurements. Do you have your device ready? No. Let me tell you what you will need. A blood pressure monitor, scale, pulse oximeter, and glucose monitor. Let me know when you are ready by pushing the button below. So as you can see, Molly is uh, not only uh, voice driven, for a lot of the seniors, that is actually a fairly big deal. They don't like apps. They don't like to figure things out. They can just talk to the avatar. She asks questions that I, as a doctor or my nurse, sets up. Measures, glucose, EKG, um, whatever it is, the vitals that I need uh, via Bluetooth or cable that goes straight into the device. Uh, she can take pictures. She can play videos. Uh, we really took a lot of care uh, to design her so she can tell me um, as a provider what I need, but in a way that is seamless and easy to use. Now when we look at the problem, chronic disease is a $2 trillion problem, but when we look at congestive heart failure in uh, particular, it is one of the most prevalent, the most comorbid, uh, and uh, it is translating into 15 million visits every year and 27.5 readmission. That is really, really bad, guys. Uh, that means a lot of very sick people that are going to the hospital and the number one reason for that is non-compliance. What does that mean? That they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing, uh, you know, what the doctor prescribed or what the nurses uh, told them. And that is what we are trying to solve. And as a doctor, I can tell you that I need something that is fast, relevant, and accurate, and I need it to be actionable. And that's what we build into Sensely. So not only we have the mobile device that goes wherever it is that the patient goes, uh, but we integrate our platform very seamlessly within the EHR. Uh, and it has several different um, features. We take all the data that comes from the patients and we analyze it for risk. And we then stratify the patients into three groups, yellow, red, and green. Green means that my patient is progressing really well. Yellow means that something is up, but it is actionable that day. And red means alert, and I need to look at it within two hours. Now, when I do look at the results, I can tell you that as a nurse, I'm really busy, or as a doctor, I don't have time to sift through what the avatar said and what the patient said. So we did it for them. That's why we analyze it and, um, and do the risk calculation. Not only that, I need to be able to act on it right away because for me, uh, if I know that something is up, I need to be able to do something about it. And so we have three little boxes there. We can look into the details and see which values triggered the alarm. We can delegate it up and down the uh, flow of command. So if it's a nurse that is manning the data, she can call on to the doctor or the registered nurse or a specialist, and we can contact the patient. We can send them another SMS, or we have a telemedicine secure portal uh, where I can connect with the patient, ask them questions, and measure the vitals in the real time. We tested on 500 patients already. Uh, we have two pilots that we completed for validation. Because this is a voice-driven platform, we validated it in Spanish as well. We have incredible rates of compliance within the um, assessment, meaning people finish the conversation all the way through. The percentages were in the 90s. And we can actually save nurses on average about 12% of their time because they don't have to do some of these things that the avatar can do. Uh, we are a SaaS model. We sell to hospitals, ACOs, and uh, on a monthly license seat. Uh, so in summary, we are really excited to reach uh, and extend the reach of doctors in the home and help them practice and the nurses the way they were trained and want to practice through the technology and it advances in the mobile revolution. Um, we are raising seed money. We already raised about 300K. Uh, and um, no, we are fully HIPAA compliant and FDA approved. Great, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> Questions? Your, uh, your demo is really cool. Thank you. It'd be fun to talk to that thing. Um, <laughs> <laughs>
So um, how do you get around uh, you know, possible liability issues in the one mm -hmm. or one to five percent percent of the time that you know, the avatar kind of records it wrong or directs the, mm -hmm. or the input information incorrectly? So we don't actually base any uh, decision factors on the voice uh, data that we collect. So you saw me, saw me push buttons. The reason why I push buttons is because anytime there is a decision point on the intelligence, it's based on, on that. Um, uh, the data that is voiced is recorded uh, and transcribed and could be searched. Uh, as far as patient inputting numbers, they don't do that. That's why we have uh, uh, Bluetooth or devices connected to that. There's always a room for error, but that's also the reason why we have risk calculations. And these assessments are done in the hospitals and for the, uh, for the patients three, five times a day. And so if something goes off, uh, you know, the likelihood of catching it very quickly is very high. And that's why we have telemedicine, so we can actually talk to the patient directly and check it out. Just following up on that, what, so what type of technology are you using um, for that accuracy? I mean, I can barely call my mobile carrier and them understand me. This is like a little bit more um, in depth. You mean so what techno voice technology? Yeah. So we use several different ones, mm -hmm. uh, but, and it's Nuance, Google. Uh, it really depends on what it is that we're doing. Some of them are better for, than others for different purposes, but we didn't invent our own uh, voice technology. So we use three third partners. So Nuance and Google are the, the most prominent. But you're not worried that the technology isn't quite up to par yet? You know, the, the technology is certainly fine for what we are doing. I wouldn't use it in a way that I would want the patient talk to the avatar and base decisions on that. And we also specifically design it so there is never an opportunity for the patient to say, I didn't understand you, can you repeat it again? That doesn't exist in our vocabulary because that's just unexcusable with a medical uh, with a medical application. And so most of the data that um, y that she says, the, the nurse, is already pre-recorded and done. Uh, and uh, most of the data that the patient says is really a qualifying information for the doctor and the nurse. Mm -hmm. It's not a decision factor. So what does an integration with a hospital or other provider look like? How long does it take? How expensive is it? Sure. What's their kind of cost? To, to, it really to depends on the EHR. We are fully integrated with all scripts. Uh, they open their API. We won one of their challenges. And so doctors can actually pull Sensely up straight from the terminal in the hospital. Uh, it took us about uh, two months uh, to, to do that within uh, you know, all the cooperation that was actually right there. Um, when you want to integrate with Epic, uh, that's pretty much impossible at the moment because Epic doesn't play with anybody on the playground. So we actually have a third partner that does that integration for the hospital and us um, because that's what people do when they have Epic. Uh, as far as the other EHRs, we certainly, we've been around only for six months. So we are s certainly capable of that integration, but we didn't do it yet. We are talking to Cerner right now. And what does it cost in general to, to integrate for the for your customer? So right now, uh, you know, we didn't have any associated cost visit because we were fully integrated with all scripts, and most of our customers are all scripts. Uh, I would imagine that the engineering cost uh, would probably run as a one-time fee somewhere in the area of ten thousands of dollars, but it would be a one-time fee. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that non-compliance was one of the biggest concerns just yes. in, in general with chronic care mm -hmm. um, and that the mission for Sensely is to reduce the cost of the care mm -hmm. for chronic care. Is Do you think that, I mean, ha have you seen the patients actually in terms of non-compliance, I don't, um, like I said, they're not doing treatment or they're not monitoring themselves, but does it actually improve that or? Yes. Um, okay. Yes, I think, you know, non-compliance means that uh, if I don't take my medicine, if I don't uh, follow the no salt regimen as a congestive heart failure, I can exacerbate over the weekend and end up in the emergency room. If I have a follow-up uh, uh, platform that can catch the increase in weight that is going to happen, uh, I am going to be able to either check on that patient and tell them to get back on track, get them some water pills that are going to reduce that. I will be able to act right away. Uh, you know, we also tested it with addiction patients. Uh, where you can identify the progression of risks. The more data, the longer we are. Uh, we will be able to tell more and faster, but that needs time. In terms of patients actually using it, is it, um, 
th is the primary distribution channel through like their doctors and the hospitals? Yes, we sell to hospitals and uh, ACOs and, and clinics. And time. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Good job. Okay. You must vote. Don't forget. Go to the URL. <laughs> Sorry, if you can bring that back. Um, <laughs> just testing, making sure they're awake back there. Thanks, guys. So basically, uh, don't forget to vote if you liked one of the first two on your phone or on the, on the web. All right, next up. Third pitch this afternoon. Uh, we basically have this company called Zao Zao. Did I say it right? Zao Zao, the ultimate online destination to discover one-of-a-kind pieces from emerging des designers in Asia. And with that, I'd like to bring to the stage Ling Kai, creative director, and Vicky Wu, the CEO. In 2012, two women in Hong Kong started a crowdfunding platform for designers in Asia. After running it for a year, they noticed an enormous demand for these designers in outside markets, and for a variety of reasons, decided to abandon the crowdfunding model. They brought on strategic partners, raised some capital, packed their bags, and moved to New York, where they began a new chapter with these key learnings in mind. And that's how we ended up here today. I'm Vicky, and this is Ling. Together, we started Zhao Zhao. Ling is Singaporean-born, but grew up all around the world. She studied and lived in New York, where she also worked at Oscar de la Renta and Lan Van in merchandising. I, myself, am a native New Yorker with roots in Taiwan. After graduating from Harvard, I joined Goldman Sachs in Hong Kong, which is where I met Ling when she was a buyer at Gucci. We moved our business to New York last year to pursue this new idea of combining content with beautiful products that we had already sourced in Asia to create the first ever destination shopping adventure. We curate unique, one-of-a-kind jewelry, bags, and accessories. Items that don't just make our wearer feel pretty, but have inspiring backstories to them as well. In addition to carefully curated merchandise, we also have, ex have exclusives, which are pieces that are created especially for us. There's a hunger for vicarious travel experiences, and we aim to feed our wonder-lasting shopper by supplying her with a constant stream of content. On our online magazine, you'll find mood boards, designer profiles, and destination-inspired content. We create content based on specific festivals and events happening in each destination on a weekly basis. We'll recommend a great outfit you can wear accessorized with our designer's items, making it easy for the shopper to envision this piece in her wardrobe and in her lifestyle. On our social media channels, you'll find travel quotes, exclusive insider tips, fashion sayings, and destination photos. Acting as your virtual tour guide, we'll, we'll dive straight into the sights and sounds of each destination, giving a shopper a glimpse into art, fashion, food, music, and more. This world away is much closer than you imagine. Our total addressable market is 20 million women, which is comprised of the style-conscious shopper. Within accessories, the relevant demographic that shops online and for non-luxury accessories, jewelry, and handbags makes up a total $7 billion out of $30 billion of spending per year. After accounting for a 15% year-on-year growth rate, we're looking at a piece of a potentially $60 billion pie in five years. And below is the math to support those claims. In scoping out the market landscape, an analysis of these two dimensions, uniqueness of product and accessibility of price point, reveals that Zhao Zhao is a clear market leader. At $12 to $400 a pop, our product offering is both unique and affordable, which is something you don't really see in this space. In summary, the key factors to our success lie in access to obscure designers in Asia and relationships that we have built, having spent physical time in the region, knowing the languages, having the relevant cultural backgrounds, 
and generally being plugged into the right networks. Furthermore, our distinct point of view and curation abilities are backed by Ling's merchandising expertise. And finally, the voice of Zhao Zhao is drawn from somewhere truly unique, given our personal backgrounds, as being emblematic of this journey that we're taking our shoppers on. And before we conclude with our video, a quote, which sums up our future plans, which involve going back into the Chinese market after we've established ourselves in the West. And without further ado, the first of our many videos. Judges, please. Hi, can, can you talk a little more about your customer acquisition strategy? Sure, so we've looked into all the various channels, social media, partnership, press, and we've decided to actually prioritize the partnerships and also creating this viral loop where we include functions in our website that allow for referrals. So we think there's this woman who obviously shares a lot, is very online, social media savvy, and so we're really targeting those people. And when I say partnership, I mean a lot of the digital publications, and also we're targeting bloggers. Have you launched yet? Have, have you done any of those partnerships? Any day now. So this is the second iteration of our website. The first one we did was actually crowdfunding, and we did that for about eight months. So we part of the key takeaways that we noticed was more than half of our traffic was coming from the states. So that's why we decided to relocate here. Can you talk a little bit about the unit economics and the model? Is this a wholesale model? Do you carry inventory? Um, we don't carry any inventory and we don't purchase any products. Everything is drop shipped. So once an order is received, the designer is responsible for directly delivering it to the end consumer. We take 40% if the item is non-exclusive and 30% if it is exclusive to our site. Um, love that you uh, are your brand. That's really cool um, that you're, you're wearing it in your own models. Um, how, how do you source and curate your merchandise at scale? How do you, uh, if this, you know, when this takes off, how do you keep up? So right now what we're doing is we're going to fashion shows, fashion trade shows, conventions, um, and then online we're going onto different social media channels. So actually Instagram and Pinterest has been a really useful tool for us to reach out to designers. Um, we, al we also have very close relationships with a lot of designers in different cities, so they actually refer a lot of their network to us. So down the road, when we do have more funding, we're going to identify people within different cities to help us identify even more designers to bring on board. I don't know if I caught this. Like In the beginning, it sounded like you're very specific um, or very intentional about only doing basically non-apparel. It's like jewelry, bags, accessories. Is that just for the short term, or do you see that as a long term, like you don't want to get into apparel? Yeah, so we don't want to deal with apparel or shoes, nothing to do with sizing, but we want to expand into home and living down the road. And, and you say this is a second iteration, so there was a, clearly a first iteration, and, uh, um, and, and, and that caused you to make some changes and, and, and set up here. How did that go? I mean, can you give me an idea of how many customers you had, what sort of revenue, you know, what happened there? Sure, so we were a crowdfunding platform, and in the first eight, nine months that we ran, we funded 47 projects, and that was across 24, 25 unique designers. And these were designers in Hong Kong, Taiwan, Singapore, Indonesia, and India. And what we found was that within the Asian English speaking market, there wasn't much demand for emerging design. So these people were still very much on the luxury track. And we were a little bit too, I think, um, premature in anticipating that the Chinese market was ready for something like this. And you know, we noticed that half of our traffic, more than half of it was coming from the States, and we had spent literally zero dollars on customer acquisition. 
And when we got to this incubator in New York, we just packed our bags and came over. Do you, do you make a video for you know, a lot of the things that you sell? Um, no, so we do it by destination. So each destination has two videos. One introduces the shopper to the destination, and another one we interview designers and influencers. How, how often do you have to update those videos? In other words, how, how much of a content site are you? Um, we're very content driven, so we do have a lot of videos coming up. We have someone that's doing it for free for us, um, and we also have editorial content, mood boards, a lot of great stuff that gets uploaded on a weekly basis. Just the last comment on that. Um, experiential buying is, is a really interesting thing that's developing as the cost of uh, content goes down. So it's not, not, not really a question, but I, I, I'll be very curious to see how that plays out. All right. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Good job. All right. Don't forget to vote. Thank you very much. Who's voting? I know, I know, and I'm just reminding you. <laughs> All right, up next, we have Renku, a discovery engine for online degrees. Sorry, my accent carried over into the beginning of the, <laughs> the name of the startup. Uh, and we're bringing to the stage Kim Taylor, the CEO. <laughs> Hi everyone. There is no place I'd rather be than here right now today. Um, so I'm Kim Taylor. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Ranku, and we are a discovery engine for online degrees. So right now, there's a huge problem in the online degree space. The way that students find universities and the way that universities find students is inefficient and broken. No one wins. When most people think about online degrees, they think about the University of Phoenix, who's Google's largest spender. That's right, they spend hundreds of thousands of dollars every single day on search, and they are really good at it. And I know because I help them build it. But they're not the only school that's online today. There are great schools already fully online today. ASU, UNC, USC, Georgetown, Georgia Tech, and there's new ones going online every day that are better and cheaper. And so Renku is here to level the playing field for universities. We solve two problems. First, we act as a consumer advocate for the user. And secondly, we're able to connect universities to the students best suited for them so they can stop competing strictly on a dollar spend. So when travel went online, we used Kayak. When reservations went online, we used OpenTable. And with education going online, everyone will use Renku. <clears throat> so how does it work? Well, we provide far more than just generic rankings. We're an unbiased search engine, meaning we'll list universities regardless of whether or not they partner with us. So results are personalized using Facebook, LinkedIn, and even a little bit of common sense. So when I get to UNC's page, I see all my friends that went there. I see the industries that they now work in. I see that they have a 97% retention rate, a 99% job placement rate, and I see that their online learning platform allows me to interact with my professor in real time. I can virtually raise my hand while she's lecturing. But how do we make money? So we monetize through universities in three ways. Through a licensing fee, through a cost per click, and then also through selling data analytics. In under seven months as a company, we already have a $500,000 run rate and are working with all of the largest schools and onboarding dozens more right now. And so we're sitting in the middle of a $20 billion market that is poised for rapid growth and change. In the next two years, you're going to see 500 traditional nonprofit universities you have already heard of go online with the helps of companies like 2U and edX. But what's our, what's our competitive advantage? Well, we're first to market. But startups are all about teams. And startups are all about teams. And startups are all about execution. My background is in online degree monetization. So I, I built and managed a $25 million portfolio of the 80 largest online universities since 2008. I, I understand their operations inside and out, everything they get wrong, exactly how to fix it. <coughs> uh, my co-founder, who's, who's over there, Cecilia, say hi. 
Um, we've been friends for more than 20 years. Uh, we grew up playing ice hockey together in Madison, Wisconsin, where we collectively led our team in penalty minutes. But more importantly, uh, she's also a lawyer, a teacher, and was the senior director of education policy at the US Chamber of Commerce, where she wrote policy for Congress on such things as immigration, the 90-10 rule, and gainful employment. She's also a workforce development expert. And so in just seven short months as a company, we built a team, we launched the product, we closed a $700,000 seed round led by Mark Cuban, Microsoft, GSV, and Lair Ventures. Um, we've onboarded all of the largest universities, and now we've aggressively attacked distribution and closed partnerships with Fortune 100 companies and also large associations with more than a million members that are interested in education. And so, you know, next step is we're, we're really looking for partners that share our vision. We think it's important that education, and especially degrees, full degrees, because that's the currency America operates on right now, um, that they're affordable, that they're accessible, and that the right ones get found in the most competitive keyword market in Google. And if you share our vision, you know, we'd, really, we'd really love to talk to you. Thank you so much. Boom. <laughs> Early 30 seconds. Judges, please. So, um, how do you tap into viral growth when um, you know, the, your examples that you give with open table, I may go to a restaurant, you know, 10 times a week, but um, I probably only would have used your service twice in my life when I was looking at um, colleges and uh, law school, so. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, obviously, like buying a car, there's a very episodic nature, so you're not gonna be searching every week for a degree, but um, when people are searching, they're actually not searching for a degree, they're searching usually, they want something else, they want a job outcome. So I think we realized that we really needed to focus on workforce development, and that's kind of where the partnerships um, with businesses came because you know people just don't want to go back to school to go back to school they want a, you know a better career so we realized we needed to have really robust job content so we started building that out so how how does the algorithm work such that you don't always end up with the same 20 schools showing up for the same people I mean no one wants to go to the I mean if you could personalize it all you want no one wants to go to the school where it's really expensive no one graduates and no one gets a job right yeah <laughs> exactly. Um, well, I think, you know, I think search is something for us that'll it'll never really be done. But we also know that um, the world is moving to a place towards personalized search where people don't want more options. They want less options and a better, you know, a better choosing experience. So if I have, um, you know, if I have an adult and the people, people that get online degrees are generally around 35 years old. So when I have an adult that um, comes to the site and they're coming from Ohio, you know, it makes a lot of sense for us to show them Big Ten schools as opposed to just a random list of schools. So that's, that's how we think about it, but then also personalized search in the sense that someone is generally logged in through Facebook or LinkedIn, so it's very powerful for their first search results to be places their friends went to school or things that are related to the industries that they're searching. But if I'm 35 year, years old, does it matter where my friends went to school 15 years ago? Um, I think so. I think so. It's in the same way, it's it's um, you know it's validating. In the same way, you would take a restaurant recommendation from a friend. Um, when you see that association of like your friend went to this school and studied this thing, we found that the click through rates are higher. Uh, you mentioned that the results are unbiased, which I think is great, and it seems like a really big part of your value prop. But then you also mentioned licensing fees and cost per click. So how do you make that jive? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so I think. We have, uni we'll list universities, like even if they don't partner with us, um, but if they want access to their data and to their traffic, then they would pay, they would pay a licensing fee. And so, because we recognize, we, we wanted to be a resource for schools that didn't have big budgets, but there are actually a lot of schools that, that do, and this traffic, um, it's important to know, like this traffic is the most, some of the most expensive traffic in Google, so they really want it. So what are they doing with those results? How does that help them? What are they doing with the data and the analytics that they're paying you for? So one of the biggest bets that universities have to make right now is, um, and it might not be a university per se, they might have partnered with like a for-profit company like a, like a 2U or academic partnerships, is a big bet that they have to make is what program at what school that will be lucrative for them but also fit the needs of the labor market. So they actually don't know who their competitors are because not every uh, university in America went online. So university, you know, UCLA went from competing with USC, the second you go online, you're competing with the whole world. So it's really powerful to them to know, well, I, my biggest competitor is actually Florida Tech or University of Scranton, and they have the closest programs to mine. 
Can you tell me more about that circle that said $20 billion? What, what is that? Yeah, sure. Um, so it's, this is actually like a very hotly debated topic on Wall Street. Um, the average cost per acquisition, the, this number we do know, the average cost per acquisition for an online degree student is $5,000. So, you know, University of Phoenix, these larger, you know, these larger big publicly traded for profits, they pay $5,000 to acquire one customer. Um, the number that's kind of generally accepted for fully online degree students is around 4 million people. So it's the 4 million times the 5,000. But I actually think that's like a really conservative number. It's higher, but I like to just focus on things that we could actually prove. So are the traditional nonprofits going to be able to pay that much for? for uh... they, they already are. And so, and it's interesting because it's um, a lot of them when they go online, they're partnering with like an enabler. So they're, they're really sophisticated. Like we're not dealing with the bureaucracy of the campus-based schools. Like once a school's gone online, they, they generally um, are like 10 times more sophisticated than one that hasn't. I, I mean, when you were showing some of the schools that you were partnered with already, um, I guess in terms of maybe not just your customers, but the breakdown of the market, like how many of them are just purely online, like University of Phoenix versus there a campus school that offers an online program? So I don't dive into it because I feel like the, the concept is kind of confusing, but we actually only list the traditional brick and mortar schools that have gone online. So we don't include University of, of Phoenix. So, cause we wanted, um, you know, their core competency in a lot of those schools, they are publicly traded companies. Their core competency is marketing. So we focus on, you know, when, when University of Scranton goes online or Simpson University or these tiny nonprofits, like we wanted to be able to help them. So. And time. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right, don't forget to vote. Um, I would make, like to make sure the clicker doesn't leave the room. Just checking, because I saw it walk out the door. Uh, we might have a problem. Last pitch! Yay! Yay! All right, Support Pay, the first automated child support payment platform that enables parents to share child expenses and exchange child support directly with each other. Very exciting stuff. Sherry Atwood, the CEO, and Lorena Chu, the CTO, please come to the stage. Thank you. It's actually just me. Uh, Lorena's not going to do this. Uh, so the relationship experts agree that the top two reasons for divorce are money and communication. Yet when you get divorced with children, you get to communicate about money. So, and that was certainly the case with me. I'm a child of a divorce and my parents had a horrific divorce and it seemed like all of their arguments stemmed around money and all the finances. So when I faced my own divorce several years ago, uh, we promised it would be amicable and it was. In fact, it cost me $350. We had multiple houses, cars, boats, and a beautiful daughter. And, but we were able to work it out for $350. But what I didn't realize was the pain was afterwards. See, I, at the time, I was a vice president of marketing. I'm traveling the globe. I'm juggling being a single parent. And I was trying to communicate with my ex-husband on who owes what for whom. And did you pay your week's childcare and your gymnastics and those things? And I realized this is such a pain. So a, I looked for a solution. And to my surprise, there was nothing out there. Then I thought, well, maybe I'm the only person with this problem. And what I found was, in the US alone, there are 55 million parents that live apart. Of those 55 million, 39 million of them actually pay and exchange child support. Most people hear about the 16 million who don't pay. Our market is the 39 million parents who actually do pay, and they're exchanging over $200 billion every year in child support and child expenses. The biggest issue is that when it comes to child support, most people think of child support as a once a month payment. So what you're looking at here is a standard California support order form. The base support is already done, it's calculated, it's income multiplied by the time with the child that gives you the base support. But there's also a page two and page three to this form. And it's these things like childcare, medical, education, or my favorite one, any special needs for the child. So not only do you have to figure out the easy part, the base amount, but how do you separate and exchange all of these other items uh, so what happens is most of the time it's, hey, did you pay this medical? Who's paying for soccer? Did you pay the childcare? And it's a lot of phone calls, text messages, emails, and ultimately conversations that happen 
when they see each other, which is when they're exchanging the child, and thereby it leads to conflicts in front of the child. And that's when the idea behind Support Pay was born. So my name is Sherry Atwood, I'm the founder and the CEO. And the goal of Support Pay is actually to save parents money. The average cost for a lawyer today, $750 per hour. Uh, it saves them time, but most importantly, it ends the conflict so that parents can focus on what matters most, their children, and not talking about these finances. The way the system works is after you register, a uh, parent will go in, they'll enter an expense, and they'll attach a receipt. The system then manages all the notifications and keeps a complete history and a complete record. The other parent logs in, sees the item, can review the receipt, and make a payment immediately. If they disagree with it, they can actually dispute it within the system, providing a reason why they dispute it and a recommended solution. This solves the two biggest pain points when it comes to parents. The person paying consistently says, I have no problem paying child support. I just want to know the money is going to my child. They can now see a receipt. They can see, and see that proof. The person receiving most of the time says, the other parent has no idea how expensive these kids really are. It really does cost you know, $150 for a pair of tennis shoes. What this ultimately gives us is a complete history and record of all of the child support, alimony, spousal support, all of those records in one location. It's a standard billing process and ultimately delivers the ability to never have to talk to your ex about money again. <laughs> From a financial perspective, our financial model gets us to 32 million in five years. It is a subscription-based service. If we reach that milestone, that's about 1% of the US, 1% of our market or about a half of a percent of the global market. Uh, how are we gonna get customers? Number one is search. Child support is searched 3.2 million times per month. It's searched in the beginning of the process. In fact, it's searched before they ever tell the other person they want a divorce and after the process. Uh, right now, we're paying 15 cents cost per click, so that's our primary method of uh, getting customers. And we also have the referral network. Um, from there, what we're averaging is about $19.99 per user, but the best part about this is the lifetime. The average user would use this for 12 years or almost $3,000. Today we have over 1,100 users. We launched less than three months ago. We have over 1,800 uh, lawyers, mediators, and judges in our referral network. And most importantly, we have a seasoned team. We are raising our seed round, $750,000 that will drive uh, continued product improvements, customer acquisition, and teeing us up for Series A. And time, thank you. <laughs> Judges, please. So can you talk a little bit um, about what software is out there right now? I think some states have something that's a little bit beyond the forms that you, that you yeah, so uh, each state has their own individual custom build application. Uh, any of those states only manage the base support, and our market is not those cases managed by the state. So the state manages anybody who is in lower income or where there are uh, parents that aren't paying. Our market is all of the other people. And there is no direct competitor, there's no one in this space. The closest thing uh, to us is there are platforms to manage communication but nobody's really focused on the hardest part, which is the finances. So I always, I always uh, uh, blink hard when I see someone say, you know, it's, it's this massive market and all we need is 1% of this market and we get this oh. much. So, so I understand you have a bottom-up model with 500,000 500, users paying how much? $20 a month revenue. So 20, $20 a month. So, so, Take me th take me through your model and maybe some of your model model companies that you are that you are emulating that have also gotten to five hundred thousand cust uh, consumer customers paying one hundred twenty dollars a month. No, twenty dollars. Right, uh, sorry, uh, one hundred twenty uh, two hundred forty dollars a year. Yeah. So uh, the model that we looked at for me it was a it was a bottoms up approach, looking at how many uh, customers we could acquire via organic and paid search. Uh, through the referral networks and the number of new cases as well as current cases on the market and how you can do that and how many you can reach per growth, plus the virality of the product. So not only do you immediately get two users, you also get all of them talking to all of their friends. Um, if you look at Mint.com, they reach, what, 10 million users 
uh, in like three years, right, from a financial perspective. Any of the financial, personal finance markets, their number of users are well, way above 500K. So, but Mint, I know Mint because I was the first investor in Mint, and they didn't, they, they, they did not do any paid acquisition. They did all, it was all PR and Correct. top level, right? So that's not the way you're going. So it's, it's, it's actually hard to build a, build uh, uh, distribution scalably through a pay-per-click model. Yes. So what, what makes you think you can do that? Uh, the, the biggest thing is the level of pain, right? This is a, not only just an emotion, uh, a problem, it's the emotional issue. It's actually the one thing they say like today, social media causes people to stop talking to each other. This is actually a case where people really don't want to talk to each other. <laughs> And so it's the pain, it's the amount of money actually being exchanged. So if you say uh, in the US, the average per month is about $3,000 total between the base and the incremental. So to that $20 is not that much money for them. Um, ideally, as we get a customer growth, there's a lot of other ways to monetize this that we could possibly go out without a paid model and get paid in other ways, like referral networks and some other areas. But just from a financial model perspective, we'd like to get $20 per user. And do both parents pay? Uh, no, both parents do not have to pay in order to use the system. The second parent would have a lighter version. And the technology is built where we can easily turn features on and off. So we could switch to a freemium model if we wanted to. Can you talk a little bit about the 1,100 customers you already have? Um, where did they come from? Uh, are they churning? Are they all paying? Yeah, so the 1,100 customers that we have is we've done it all through search. Um, a few referral, the referral networking, we just started uh, two, two months ago. So about 87% uh, of our traffic is just search. And our budget is $25 a day. So it's a huge amount of money right now going to it. Um, and we are getting a 77% complete registration rate. We're getting an 80% connection rate, meaning both parents. And what we found when we were in beta was it takes about three months for a customer to become sticky. So that's three transactions in a payment. So we haven't introduced a subscription pricing yet so that we can get them sticky. Um, so it's free registration essentially and it would be a three month trial. Did, did you say it's $3 for a customer acquisition cost? That's what we're paying today. Uh, just because the, you know, we're bootstrapping, but our estimated customer acquisition cost is $22.85. If they're paying $20 a month and presumably you charge them, you will charge them right away? It's after three months. Okay, after three months? Yes. So, I mean, if, if, if still, if the payback is that fast, then are you able to do a test, you know, with like 50 grand and just see if that really is the money machine that you're talking about? Yes, absolutely. So it's just the matter of the, the money. We did uh, do a few tests of spending more uh, per day on, and we saw a direct correlation between registered users and the number of um, users that we got, the more we paid. Um, but the point being there is that we're, we would be able to actually test that and test if what the right price point is. So I'm not saying 20 bucks is the right price point, that's just where we based our financial model. In time. Thank you, thank you, thank, thank you. you. Awesome. Okay, now the vote slide matters to you. Vote, 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 vote.